All right. YouTube says I'm live. So uh, let's do a quick audio check. If you can hear me, then throw something in the chat so I know that people can hear me. Um, I have myself open on another screen as well. So I hope that that doesn't play or at least doesn't play audio. It doesn't seem so. So welcome, welcome. Today we will be talking about RNA sequencing. Um, I did a very quick poll on my YouTube channel um, and uh, RNA sequencing came out on top. Uh, I was hoping that a little bit more people would have voted for the deprogramming language, um, but apparently it's not as popular as expected. So let's switch to me so you guys can see me as well. So building your own pipeline from scratch. I'm really excited about it. Um, I had to do this actually three weeks ago um, because I moved. So um, instead of being in Berlin, I'm now in Newcastle um, at North Umbria University. I'm still wearing my Humboldt shirt, but that's okay. Um, so yeah, let's just start setting up our own pipeline. Um, uh, I've got a completely new setup, so I hope it's audible and um, <laughs> stick to your route. Yeah, no, I hope it's 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 audible and it's good because I've been fidgeting a lot with the whole setup thing. Um, it's difficult, right? Because you have all of your equipment set up just the way that you want it. And then all of a sudden you move to somewhere else. So everything has to be packed. Everything has to be unpacked. Um, so I hope everything works and that it's going to be good. So if there's any problems with the audio, um, let me know as soon as possible because then I can, can fix it. All right. So for today, um, I think that the main thing today will be setting up a Linux environment um, and we're going to go through it step by step. I want this to be a very useful tool for other people when um, they set it up. So of course there will be some steps since I'm streaming from under Windows. Um, I of course have to set up virtual box and these kinds of things first, um, but I will take you guys through all of these steps. So we will actually be installing Linux as well. Um, and then uh, we will, start setting up every tool that you need. So there's going to be a lot of tools. Um, so if you want to follow along with me, I've put all of my code and scripts that I'm going to use today um, as a gist. Hi, sir. I've done RNA sequencing pipelines with my master of science, and we did it all on Galaxy, the website. I am following your course to learn how to do it with command lines and be able to value this knowledge. Yeah, no, um, I think that there's many different ways of doing it. I posted it on Reddit as well, and people there said like, oh, why are you using, not using NextFlow or uh, VSL2, uh, which is the integration with Windows. And I just decided to do it this way because it allows me to guide you guys through the whole process. Um, that being said, I don't think that we will align a single read today because the setup itself takes a long time. There's a lot of different tools that we need. Um, and I hope that we can finish today with indexing um, the genome and that would be good. Um, and of course, perhaps downloading some reads from the short read archive to, uh, for the next step, build our own pipeline. So like I said, if you want to follow along, um, this is the uh, link. Uh, let me put the link in chat as well so that people can just click on it um, and um, so this is the link um, to the git. Uh, it's just a gist. So there are three files in there and um, it will allow you to kind of copy paste in the commands um, since the PowerPoint is not available. I will make the PowerPoint available later on and then you guys can just, um, well, click on the links in the PDF file. But um, for so far, we are just gonna do it like this. and That's it. Good, so when we want to start our own Linux environment in Windows, we have multiple options. So we can things like, uh, think, we can take things like QEMU, we can do VirtualBox, um, there's the Windows subsystem for Linux as well. Um, but I thought it would be good to just start off doing VirtualBox because it's relatively easy um, and it nice, nicely containerizes the, the, the Linux system from the Windows system. And in that sense, it's also very clear for you guys. So for today, I decided to go with Debian. So Debian is a slightly unusual operating system, I think, to use for bioinformatics um, because 
generally people use either Ubuntu or CentOS. Um, it has many more tools built in. Um, but since I didn't want to use any built-in tools, but wanted to download and install all of the stuff from scratch, um, like the title says, building your own pipeline from scratch, uh, we will be starting by VirtualBox and Debian. So let me actually switch to my layout so, um, so that you guys can see my desktop. I hope this is clear. Um, I hope it's visible. Um, but I've downloaded a couple of files already just to prevent um, like long download times. Um, so I have the VirtualBox, um, I have the VirtualBox extensions and Debian and uh, so the NetEase, which is a very small file, it downloads everything. Um, so I would advise anyone trying this at home to use the NetEase because then you can just download all of the packages as we go. Um, but if, if for the for myself, I've downloaded this 3.8 gig image, so the installation doesn't have to use the internet. So it just goes a little bit faster. Uh, come on in chat. This is a new field for me, but our lab is ordering Oxford Nanoports. Got an opportunity to learn from you. Well, yeah. Um, if you have nothing set up, then this is it. This is this is the lecture for you, so to speak. All right, so let's quickly go through to the PowerPoint. So we will be using VirtualBox. I will be installing Debian. Of course, you can use any Win, uh, any Linux version that you want, um, but um, I went for Debian because it's a little bit different. Um, there are a couple of things, a couple of quirks, which we will get to, but um, remember everything or every time that you see Danny somewhere, right? If you're installing Linux, you have to choose a username. And of course, you are free to use your own name. You don't have to use my name for it. Good, so let's switch back to the desktop and we will first start installing VirtualBox. So just double click the installer. I'm gonna press yes, because it asked me if I want to be an administrator. And I'm just gonna say next. Um, I think everything is fine. We're just gonna leave everything on the default settings, default location. Um, I do not want a shortcut on the desktop. Um, you can be in the quick launch bar and you can be in the start menu, no problem. Um, so networking features will reset your network connection temporarily. So I hope this works. I hope this doesn't break the stream, um, but let's see what happens. <laughs> All right, so, and then we just press install and it will start installing. So I'm hoping that it's going to automatically reconnect the stream and not gonna cause any major issues. Um, so start it. Seems to have uh, no issues, I think. At least I hope I'm still live. All right, so once we've installed it, um, we get this um, Oracle Box VM thing. Um, so we have to start making our own virtual machine. Um, so for that, I'm going to go to machine. I'm gonna say make a new machine and the name of it is going to be Debian um, because then it will recognize that I'm going to install a 64-bit Debian. And here you can choose the machine folder. So we will do a whole virtual machine. Is there an advantage of dual boot over virtual machine? Yeah, dual boot gives Linux direct access to your um, CPU. So by doing it like this, you're in a environment within Windows. Um, so it will be a lot slower. Um, not that much slower. VirtualBox is pretty good, um, but it's not as, as bare to the metal, so to speak. Um, if you would do it to bare metal, it would be quicker. Um, not only that, but you can use all of your different CPUs. Right, because that's one of the disadvantages of using VirtualBox is that I have to select how many CPUs I'm going to use. And of course I'm streaming as well, so I'll probably leave it to one or two. All right, so recommended memory, I'm going to allocate at least a little bit more. So I'm going to use four gigs of memory. I have enough memory in my machine, so that shouldn't be an issue. Um, I want to create a virtual hard disk now and then what do I want to do? Well, let's just go for the virtual box disk image. Um, the other two allow you to use it in other virtualization software. Um, but in, in this case, I think it's fine because we're just going to use it here. So I'm going to do a fixed sized allocation. Um, so this will take a little bit more time up front to create the hard drive, um, but it will be faster as we are using Linux. So I think that that will be good. So here we have to specify how much memory we want for our virtual box. And this has to be as much as you can spare. Um, but for the sake of, of this tutorial, I will do 32 gigs. Um, so it's gonna take up 32 gigs of my hard drive. So when I press create, it will start making a big file on my hard drive, which is kind of a, a, a hard drive where everything is on. 
All right, so this will take a little bit of time. And this is one of the things that you will have to get used to when you do bioinformatics. Everything will take a little bit of time and all of these little bits of time will add up. Um, it's just two minutes remaining. It's not gonna be that bad, um, but it is going to take a little bit of time. So if you would have selected the dynamic allocation, it would finish instantly. Uh, but then every time you write a file under Linux, um, it means that it has to make the hard drive a little bit bigger. So you get a lot of slowdown in, in, in the end. So we'll just wait for this process to finish a little bit um, because it's just the way that it is. And this is something that for bioinformatics is very, very common. You're going to sit around a lot of the times just doing nothing, um, talking to colleagues while you wait for the computer to finish. Um, and of course, in this case, it is also having an issue with the fact that I'm streaming it. Um, can I boot my PC into Ubuntu and follow? Yeah, of course. Yeah, if you are in Ubuntu, that works perfectly well. Uh, you don't have to set up VirtualBox in Debian. Um, Ubuntu also uses the apt-get system, so it has the same package manager, so everything should be perfectly fine. Um, so while we set up the virtual uh, virtual hard drive and the virtual machine, just boot into Linux uh, or boot into Ubuntu and just follow along um, when we start installing programs there. All right, one minute, 39 seconds remaining. I tested it out yesterday and um, Without streaming, it was a little bit quicker. But of course, now the uh, OBS is also taking. Is this installation process work with Mac? Uh, no, with Mac, you can actually do the exact same thing. So just download the uh, virtual machine. Um, you have to download the Mac version, of course, for VirtualBox. Um, let me actually, while this is running, I can pull up the, uh, the Firefox thing. Um, so that is me, which is a little bit annoying. That's not something. Um, but if you go and you just type in VirtualBox, um, then um, if you go to VirtualBox, then it says Oracle VM Box. Um, and then here in the download section, um, we can go to downloads. Um, then here you have the, the Windows host and the OS X host. Um, so just download the OS X version. Uh, remember that we also need the extension pack. So the extension pack is here. Um, so you can download the extension pack from there. And the extension pack will allow you to copy paste um, from one uh, operating system to the other, um, which is really, really useful. So there's uh, there's different, uh, different builds available. Um, I am using VirtualBox 6.0. Um, so if you just go to 6.0, then you can see all of the different downloads options here. Um, so if you are on Mac, you can use the OS X. If you are on Windows, use the Windows one. And for all of the different distributions of Linux, there's also Linux versions. But if you boot into Linux, um, then you can just use the Linux one. So this is the one that we can download. Um, let me actually show you where you can get the uh, Debian Net ISO as well. So you just type in Debian Net ISO and um, it will tell you hey, the first Google link says minimal install from CD. Um, and then you can download the CD here. Um, just take the AMD 64 version, which is the 64 bit version. Um, and then it's like 300 MBs of download. So it's a little bit of downloading. Um, VirtualBox itself is also like 100 to 200 MB. All right, very good. So let's go back to the desktop and it's almost done. All right, so once it's created the virtual hard drive, um, you can see that it actually directly switches to Debian, right? So now we have to make some settings because um, I want to go to settings and I want to kind of update it a little bit. Um, so I go to advanced and I say shared clipboard. I want to have this bi-directional, which means that I can copy things in Ubuntu or in Debian and paste it in Windows or copy things in Windows and paste it into the virtual box. This cannot be done directly. We first have to set up some other stuff. Um, and these are this is where the guest software and the extension tools come in. Um, we go to system. Um, this looks all fine. Um, I do go into the processor tab and say, start using two processors, just so that the installation runs a little bit quicker. Um, you can actually extend this uh, PAX NEX, um, which will allow you to, it, it, will, it will make the virtual box run a little bit closer to the metal. Um, but I'm not going to do this because it has an impact on the streaming performance. Um, so after we set this, we can go to display. You can say, well, use a little bit more video memory because we are going to start a desktop. Um, 
there's only one monitor, which is fine. And I'm going to set this to VirtualBox VGA. And this has to do um, with um, the fact that otherwise your mouse cursor might be a little bit messed up. Um, I'm going to enable 3D acceleration. I'm going to do that, although it will or it might impact streaming a little bit. Um, but this is just so that the operating system runs a little bit faster. So now the most important part is when we go to storage, um, we can go here and we can click on empty, right? So we see that there's a CD drive in the virtual machine and the CD drive is currently empty. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to mount the ISO, the Debian net ISO that I just downloaded. So this 300 MB file. I am actually going to mount the 3.6 gigabyte file because it has all of the packages. So I'm just going to say, choose a virtual drive and I'm going to go into my downloads and here I'm going to select the DVD. So when I click open, it will now tell me that on the hard drive or on the, on the CD-ROM player in the virtual machine, we have the Debian ISO mounted. All right, so that's everything for now. So we just press OK. Um, it tells me that there's some invalid settings detected on the bottom. What is that? No, it seems to be okay. All right, no problem. So we just press start and it will start the virtual box. And that will take a little bit of time. So here we go. This is our virtual machine. Um, so this is our kind of computer in a computer. And here we are presented with the Debian graphic installer. Um, so we can install it via the non-graphical installer, but for the sake of, of completeness or beauty, um, we are just going to do the graphical install. Can this analysis be done in the Windows subsystem for Linux as well? Yes, you can do this in the Windows subsystem for Linux as well, um, but then you have to enable it and install it um, and then use this. Um, so yeah, the, after and all of the things that we will be doing in the virtual box, um, the same commands can be used in the Windows system. Um, make sure that you use a Debian or Ubuntu type operating system, because most of the commands that will be there are using the opt uh, package manager. Um, so you have to have the opt package manager. Um, it's not a big deal if you use Fedora or something, which uses a different package manager, um, but then the names of the packages might be a little bit different. All right, so I'm going to um, take English as my language because I'm speaking English quite well. I am located in the United Kingdom, so I'm going to select that. Um, I'm not going to use British English. I'm going to use American English because my keyboard is American English. So I have a standard um, USA 101 keyboard layout. Um, of course, if you have a different keyboard, select the keyboard that you have. All right, so then it will start uh, scanning and doing some additional things like setting it up um, and then it will continue with some more questions. Um, so the network was detected, hopefully. Yep, perfectly fine. All right, so it's doing the configuration of the network. So this should all work out perfectly fine because I'm just connected with a ethernet cable. Um, the host name can be Debian or you can choose whatever you want. You can choose a different host name like my RNA sec machine or whatever but I'm just going to go with the default. Um, the domain name, just leave it empty since I'm not on a domain. Um, this matters, for example, when you're inside of a university and your university has a top level domain. Um, but in this case, I'm at home, so I don't have a domain running here. All right, so now we have to type a root password. So I'm just going to go with the default password of one, two, three, four. Um, oh, I have to do numlock, one, two, three, four. Um, and in theory, this doesn't matter too much, right? Um, just don't leave it empty because it will complain about that. Um, so I'm just going to take a password, which is easy to remember. Um, all right, then it asked me for the full name of the new user. Well, I am Denny Arens, so I will just fill that in. Hello, I am trying to install MSA package in my R studio, but I'm encountering an error. I'm Google search, but all to no avail. Can you please help me out? Um, yes, send me an email and send me uh, the warning and error that you're getting. We're not going to do it now because we're going to set up an RNA pipeline and that's going to take enough time already, but um, I can help you out. Um, just drop me an email on my Gmail. Good, so then we have to 
select the username. So the username Danny is going to be perfectly fine. And I have to choose a password for myself. So I'm going to take the one, two, three, four password again, and I'm going to verify that with one, two, three, four. All right, continue setting the clock, detecting the disks, that all should be perfectly fine. And then it will start the partitioner. So the partitioner is a big deal in Linux. Everyone likes to set up their Linux machine in the exact same way or different ways, depending on what their flavors are. But I am just going to say guided, use the entire disk. So I created this 32 gigabyte disk and we're going to use all of it. Um, I'm not going to dual boot. So in case you're installing Debian or Ubuntu yourself um, on your Windows, then this is the critical part because this is the part where you could override the current Windows system that is on there. Um, so if you're making a dual boot, then at this point you have to be very, very careful. But since we're in a virtual box, I can just say, use the entire disk. Um, and then it tells me that there's one disk drive, which is 32 gigs big. I'm just going to say continue, and I'm going to take all of the files in one partition. Um, normally, if you would do a dual boot system, um, you probably want to separate the home, the far and the temp partitions and resize them the way that you want to. Um, but in this case, I'm just gonna use the whole thing and it's gonna be one partition um, and it's going to be um, no issues whatsoever. Okay, and I'm then going to click on finish partitioning and write changes to disk. Um, and then I'm going to have to confirm that by clicking on yes. Otherwise, if I leave it on no, the default setting, then it unfortunately will go back to the partition. So I'm just gonna click yes. I'm gonna press continue and then it will start partitioning the disks and it will now install the base system. Um, so it will install a very minimal Linux on, on the hard drive that we just created. All right, this will take a little bit of time, um, not too long, but um, it's, it's just gonna take a little bit of time. Um, and again, like the more CPUs you allocate to your virtual box, the quicker this will run. But I only allocated two because I also need a CPU for rendering the stream. I also need a CPU for um, running the Firefox um, so that I can see you guys chatting. Um, so it, it's going to be a little bit of a, of a problem. So that's one of the things, of course, is that if, if you want to do RNA sequencing for real Zs, so to speak, right? So then of course, install Linux on your system directly. So then Linux can use all of your hard drive. So if you're aligning reads, and then you can use all eight cores or 12 cores or the amount of cores that you have in your system. Um, currently, because I'm running in a virtual box, two CPUs is the maximum that it can use. Um, so it's, it's gonna be a little bit slower and a little bit limiting. All right, so installing the base system. I actually noticed a slowdown compared to yesterday when I was testing it out. Um, so it is, uh, it is not as, uh, as, as good as it can be. All right, so it's installing App Armor, which is the kind of default firewall, and then a little bit of extra packages, and then it should all be fine. All right, so now it asks me if I want to scan for additional media, but I already have the whole, like the, the, the 33.6 gigabyte image. Um, so I'm not gonna scan for additional installation media. Um, it could be that you have like a two CDs or three CDs installation. Um, then here you would click yes, and you would put in a new um, CD-ROM into the hard drive or in the, into the CD-ROM drive, but we're not going to do that. We're just gonna continue. Use a network mirror. Um, Yes, I am going to use a network mirror because we do want to get the latest updates for all of the packages. Um, plus by using a network mirror, it's also going to set up my, um, my eventual installation to have, <clears throat> to have a network. All right, so we have to figure out where, so I'm going to say I'm in the United Kingdom and then it tells me that this one is the closest one, um, which is perfectly fine. So we're just going to use that. Um, we do not need an HTTP proxy. So in case you're behind a proxy server, fill in the information here, but I'm directly connected to the internet, so I don't have to. So it's updating opt, which is the package manager. Um, and then it will present me with a choice. And this choice is going to be, what do you want to install? So it will 
retrieve some files from the internet, make sure that all of the packages are to the latest version. And then I can, uh, do I want to, no, I don't want to participate in the popularity contest. You can, of course, if you want. So I'm just going to install, uh, install the desktop environment. We're going to use GNOME for that. Um, and we're going to install all of the standard system utilities. So the default settings are fine. I'm just going to press continue. And now it will start installing Linux. So it will retrieve all of the files. Um, in this case, if you are using the net image, um, then this part is going to be um, taking a long time because now it needs to download all of them. In this case, it like most of the packages are on the CD. Um, so it finds all of them. And as you can see, it's now downloading or it should download four additional packages, which are updates um, since I downloaded the DVD because the DVD is a little bit out of date. All right. So let's hope that this doesn't hang too long. All right. An installation step failed. That doesn't matter. We can just press continue and I just want to install the software. So don't, don't worry about this part. Um, do I want to install security updates? I understand how busy you are. Can you help me with a tutorial co-expression project using plans in the ACS study? Um, I might, uh, but um, like I said, I'm streaming now, so I'm trying to focus on the RNA sec thing and um, just send me an email. If I have time, I will, I will definitely reply to all of the emails that I get. And based on my time, um, we can see what is possible. So no guarantees. But I'm always interested. I do not want to participate in the popularity contest. Yes, this is what I want. So I don't know why it failed to download those four additional packages, but we'll just try it again. So now I directly found them. So it's probably just a very temporary um, internet issue, um, which sometimes happens, right? If you're installing and it uses the network during the installation, it might not uh, find all of the packages in one go. It might be that there's a small hiccup on the Ubuntu side, um, but at least we're installing now. So I checked it yesterday. It will take around five, six minutes. Um, so for that, of course, we can just have a little bit of music while we wait. So I'm just going to start some barn music and then, uh, oh, that's wrong. That's wrong. That is really, really wrong. Why are you playing on the wrong audio speaker? You should be playing on this one and then a little bit of music. That should be a lot better audio wise. All right, so do your thing. And again, like I said, bioinformatics is a lot of this. It's a lot of waiting and um, make sure that you always have your favorite like playlist somewhere. So you can just put in some headphones and uh, listen to some music while you wait. This one is actually pretty nice. So I'm actually using uh, the uh, Stream Deck to play music, um, which allows me to play copyright free music, which is really nice. I, I really love this uh, Stream Deck. I'm so happy that I got it. So we're already 50% done. So we'll take a little bit of time. So if you already have a Linux machine, then of course this part is going to be a little bit of boring. Um, but uh, if you don't and you just want to follow along, uh, then this is the time to catch up because and just give it four CPUs and it will install a lot faster than mine is. And of course, like I was thinking about when we have everything recorded, um, I will probably cut out these pieces um, so that when this video or the video of the live streams will go live, um, of course, we're not sitting here waiting for like 10 minutes for Ubuntu to install. That doesn't really make that much sense. So.
So yeah, if you're in chat, let me know. Uh, we can talk about anything now, like uh, the uh, MSA package. Uh, like I said, just send me an email. I will always reply to emails. Uh, and uh, if there's any other questions so far, just throw them in the chat. And if you're just here hanging out, then uh, throw something in the chat as well. It really helps out for the YouTube algorithm. The more people are active in chat, just saying random stuff like uh, RNA sequencing. Um, it helps YouTube to say, well, oh, this stream is doing really well. Like there's a lot of people interacting. Um, and I'm trying to get monetized um, and I'm almost there. So fortunately we don't have things like super fans and all of these things uh, in the chat yet. Um, but I'm relatively close to monetization now. So I'm hoping that uh, you guys can support me and uh, I've been very, very happy with the whole YouTube thing so far. Like it's been overwhelming the amount of positive reactions that I've gotten to the lectures that I posted. Uh, so that actually decided me to do this, right? To continue um, streaming in my free time and teaching you guys things like this, RNA sec. Um, and I'm still thinking about doing a deprogramming language course um, because the deprogramming language, it's a really, really good language. I really like it. Um, and I think everyone should learn a little bit of D. Um, and it's nice because I'm Danny, so it's good that the programming language starts with the same letter as my first name. Yeah, so the streaming does have an effect. When I did it yesterday, it took around five and a half minutes to install Linux, but it's still not too bad, right? Imagine installing Windows. Windows on average takes like half an hour to an hour to install. And uh, what will be your advice for a plant breeder that wants to focus more on computational biology and bioinformatics at PhD level? Um, well, what will be my advice? Like what kind of advice are you looking for? I think that it's always possible to uh, focus on computation because a lot of the research groups that you will end up in doing your PhD at, um, they have a need for bioinformatics. Like nowadays, anyone who can program and is working in biology is a very, very valuable asset. Um, I would learn a lot of genetics because in plant breeding, genetics is key, right? Um, genetics is very important. Um, I would focus on statistics because in plants, the large sample size that you have is uh, a big advantage. So it will allow you to do some very, very fancy statistics. Um, what skills will be valuable? Um, well, um, Linux, shell scripting, a little bit of R or Python. So one of the two, it doesn't really matter too much. Um, but I would also look um, to learn a little bit of C and C programming. All right. Let's stop the music, we're done. So it's installing the bootloader so we can restart. Um, but that, those are the skills, right? So the best skills that you can have are just being able to program. So that doesn't matter if you're using R or if you're uh, using Windows or something else. Um, and shell scripting is really useful. The ability to use Linux, uh, one of the things that is a very good addition as well is things like high performance computing. So lear learn something like a Q submission system like Slurm or QSub or um, the other systems which are on use on clusters. All right, so uh, it seems that your installation is complete. Um, install group, yes, we want to install the bootloader. We want to put it on the hard drive and then we just want to press continue. And then we should be more or less almost done. Um, there's still a couple of little things that it will finish up, um, but then we have our first Linux system running. Very good. And of course, this is a really nice way to learn Linux, right? Just putting it into a virtual box allows you to play with it without um, having to risk deleting Windows or these kinds of things. All right, so installation is complete. So we'll just press continue and it will finish and it will reboot. 
So for, for, um, fortunately for us, VirtualBox will actually notice that we have installed an operating system, so it will automatically unmount the drive, the installation drive. Um, so we will just choose uh, Debian. Um, and the first things that we're going to do is actually um, boot into Debian and then shut it down um, because we want to now install the VirtualBox extensions. Um, so to be able to use higher resolutions and have drag and drop and these kinds of things work. Um, numlock, one, two, three, four, that's our password. And then we are in Debian. So looks really nice, um, uh, but we are going to shut it down first. So I'm just going to say power off and power off. All right, so now in VirtualBox, I want to install the um, extension pack. Right? I told you guys that not only download VirtualBox, but also download the VirtualBox extension pack. So I'm going to go to File, Preferences, and then I'm going to go to Extensions, and then I'm going to say Plus, and then I'm going to go to the software that I downloaded. And here we have the file that you have to download as well. So it's the Oracle VM VirtualBox extension pack um, 6.1.38. And this has to match the version of the VirtualBox that you're using. So if you're using an older version of VirtualBox, then download the corresponding um, extension pack. So I'm just going to install it. I have to scroll all the way down, press I agree, um, and then it will say um, installed successfully. So there it is. All right, so I'm going to press OK, and then we are going to start our Debian system again, um, just to make sure that, because now have we, we now have installed it in the, in the host operating system, and now we are going to install the same thing into the virtual machine as well so that the two can talk to each other and that we can do things like copy paste but also make the make the screen bigger um, run in any resolution that we want so my password is one two three oh um look that's wrong one two three four that's it all right, so here we have our Debian, and now we are going to go to here, and we are going to say devices, insert guest additions CD image. And now when we go to activities, then here when we go to files, we now see that we have an additional hard drive, uh, additional CD-ROM mounted. And this has the additions. So now we run into one of these little things. Um, so let me actually go back and show you guys the PowerPoint. Um, so the problem here is, is that by default, when Debian installs, it does not give us pseudo writes. So we are just a regular user. So we can do two things, right? So we could always say, well, I'm going to use root for everything, which you should not do. Or we can make ourselves pseudoers, which means that if we want, we can ex execute commands as if we were the super user. Um, so let's just go back and I'm going to uh, make ourselves in the sudo group. So I'm just going to say activities. I'm going to search for terminal. And first things that I'm going to do is I'm going to add the terminal to my favorites and then I'm going to start it up. So now next time when I go to activities, the terminal is going to be here. And don't worry, once we've got the extensions working, we can scale up this window and we can have a normal resolution instead of 800 times 600. So I'm going to switch to the super user, the super user password, that's the one that it asks for now. In our case is one, two, three, and four, which is the same. So now we are root and now we can do anything on the system. So I'm going to say user mod um, minus add group and I'm going to add the pseudo group to my own user. And if I wanted to check this, um, I can issue another command. I forgot the command that I can use to check this, um, but um, it should be okay. So I'm going to say exit, and then I'm going to reboot the virtual machine just so that it uh, updates my user account. Because I'm logged in, um, it's better to just quickly restart the whole machine um, to make sure that it um, updates my user account to have pseudo rights. And it starts quick enough, so that's not an issue at all. It's one of these things that I love about Linux. Linux is really, really fast and really responsive in these kinds of things. Good, so I'm going to add my password. And now when I open up a terminal, which is put here, I can now just say um, 
sudo soup. And it tells me that I have to think and respect. Um, I'm going to give my own password. And now you can see that I can directly switch and be a root user. So I'm going to say exit. And we are going to go and install the VirtualBox extension. So let me see if it still has the CD mounted. I'm going to go to files. So the virtual box is still mounted, as you can see. Um, so we're just going to go there, right? So um, I'm going to go and say, uh, let me show you the slide first, just to make sure. Um, so and the extension pack, we did that. So I'm just going to set up the guest edition. So I'm going to go to the CD-ROM and then I'm just going to execute this command to make sure that inside of Linux, it also installs the additional software. So let's just do that. So I'm going to go and say cd slash media slash cd-rom zero. I'm going to do ls and it did not mount the cd-rom properly. Let me actually see why not. It might have mounted it under a different cd-rom. It might not be cd-rom zero. It might be cd-rom like um, one or cd-rom two or something like that. Anyway, let's just move this aside and see if it found it. See if it mounted it on a different CD-ROM. It did. So it mounted it on CD-ROM instead of CD-ROM zero. So there's sometimes little differences and that's just because of little changes to the system. So we're gonna issue the command. So we're going to say sudo, so switch as a super user, do an sh shell, and then within this shell execute vbox, Linux editions, editions dot run. All right, so it will install it. And now we should be able to copy paste from Windows into Linux. Um, so let me quickly test that. Um, so let me get a screen like this. And I'm just going to try to copy code available into this window by saying right click and it doesn't work yet. That's a shame. Um, I'm going to go and go to devices, shared clipboard, disabled, devices, shared clipboard, bidirectional. I'm not sure why it doesn't allow me to copy. Nope. Unfortunately, it still doesn't work. All right, but it was, oh, it says here, running kernel modules will not be replaced until the system is restarted. So let's do a restart then just to make sure. So we're gonna go here, we're gonna say power off and restart the system just to make sure. So I'm just gonna keep this on the side so I can just see if copy pasting works. Alrighty. All right, so let's log in again. Right, um, open up a terminal that's there, and I'm just going to say copy paste. Yay! Perfect. So that works. And one of the things that will also work now is um, going to um, display settings, and then I want to have a bigger resolution so you guys can see it a little bit better. I think that one should be okay. Right, and then this one can go back to the other screen. All right, so now we have our working Linux. Very nice, very nice, very nice. Good, so that is part number one, getting Linux installed. So of course, if you're there and you already have Linux installed, um, then it's not going to be that much work. Um, but if you're under Windows, then this will allow you to install a virtual box. All right. Next part, let's go back and see what is the next step. Good, so the RNA-Sec pipeline looks like this. And if you're very interested in RNA-Sec and all of the things regarding RNA-Sec, I already did a lecture about um, RNA sequencing in general um, and about how sequencing works. So those are in my bioinformatics course. But this is a slide that I took from my bioinformatics course um, and I just list here all of the different things that need to be done. And then here I'm listing the programs that we need for this. 
So for read trimming, so when we have an RNA sec read, we need to snip off um, the, the bad quality parts. We also need to snip off the adapters um, because when you do RNA sequencing, you generally ligate adapters um, to your little piece of DNA or RNA sequence. Um, and we're going to use Trimomatic for that. So for the alignment, we need to use a splicing aware aligner. So we can't just use BWA. BWA is a DNA aligner. Um, so in this case, we are going to use the star aligner. So the star aligner as an input requires two different files. One of them is the genome and one of them is the transcriptome. So it is aware that um, reads in RNA-seq do not directly come from the genome, but sometimes span an intron exon boundary. So we will come to that when we are there. Um, we need to remove duplicates. Um, so PCR is a step. Um, so we need to remove PCR duplicates from our data, um, which we can do using PCAR tools. We need to do indel realignment, base recalibration. So that means that if we have a known SNP in the genome, we need to be able to handle those and we need to be able to make sure that reads that have a SNP in them a known SNP, do not get penalized for that. And then we're going to use bed tools to extract read counts. Um, I, we can then use um, genomic features in R to compute RPKMs, and then we're going to use preprocess core for normalization. And of course, all of these parts are more or less flexible, right? You could choose a different aligner. Um, you could choose a different tool to do indel realignment. You can use a different tool to extract your read count. Um, but this is kind of the pipeline that I wanted to set up um, because it's worked relatively well for me in the past. Um, there are tools that you can swap in and out. There's, there's many different tools which do adapter trimming or um, read trimming. There's many different aligners, um, but that is one of the nice things that I wanted to show you guys is that it's very flexible. So you can move things out, you can move things in, um, and it's kind of a modular system in a way. Um, but let's get started, right? Because there's a lot of tools that we still need to install. And of course, one of the things that's not on the list is the SRA toolkit. Um, so we will use the short, uh, the sequence read archive to download data. Um, and for that, we need the SRA toolkit. And that will, of course, also be installed. So here I have a slide. It looks a little bit messed up because I clicked some of the links. Um, but um, when I put the... PowerPoint online, um, this will allow you to click on the corresponding one and directly go to the page where um, there's more information or directly to the download page. So this is just a slide for you guys uh, that when you download the PDF, um, you can just click um, on the name of the program, go there, read a little bit more about it and directly download the tools. Um, but of course, we will also download them new. Good. So fortunately, R can just be installed via the Debian package manager. So we can just do a sudo opt install R base, um, which uh, will install R. So let's do that now, right? Um, so let's go and get um, the install software. So I'm just going to get, say sudo opt get install. So I need to get a terminal. And fortunately, I can now copy paste. Um, so I'm going to just put my terminal here, make it a little bit bigger and I'm going to just paste in the command. I have to give my password, my pseudo password, which is one, two, three, and four. And it will just say, I'm going to install a whole bunch of things. So I'm going to say yes. And now it complains, right? And I already had that on the slide that sometimes it will complain about the fact that the CD-ROM is not there. So we have to disable the CD-ROM because at this point I don't want to use the CD-ROM anymore. Um, so I'm, I, I'm not going to mount it again. Um, so I'm going to change that, right? So um, if we look on the PowerPoint, um, like I already said that sometimes it complains about the CD-ROM. So we can just do, um, we can update the sources list. So the sources list is where it will get its data from. So this is just a list of more or less URLs and paths, um, which it will search for software. So let's do that. Let's say sudo nano etc. Oh, um, slash slash etc. Um, let me actually switch you guys back to here. Um, and then it is going to be opt. 
which we are interested in. And then it is the sources.list. And I'm just going to update that. So I'm just going to find the CD, which is here. And I'm just going to put a hashtag in front of it. I'm going to press Control O for writing it out. And then I'm going to press Control X for exiting. Good. So now we execute the command again. And now it should not complain about the stupid CD-ROM because now we disabled the CD-ROM. So it will check all of the different online repositories. It will download all of the tools and start installing them. All right, so we'll take a little bit of time again, but I told you guys that's bioinformatics for you. So next step is to install genomic features and pre-process core. So genomic features is used to extract read counts all the way at the end of the pipeline. And pre-process core is something that we will use for normalization. Um, but these two packages have a lot of dependencies. So we have to install three different things. So we have to install libssl. Um, so libssl means that um, it's a development package that allows us to compile stuff which requires SSL connections. XML2 is there so that we can read XML files. And curl is there um, based on the open SSL flavor um, because we want to make connections to uh, network and internet tools. All right, so let's switch back and install those packages. So you can see that R was installed successfully. All right, so I'm just going to copy paste all three commands in, um, which might not work properly, um, but I'm just going to install these three packages um, and they're relatively small, so that will be really, really fast. All right, so now we can install, or so now we can start R. Um, so let me switch to the PowerPoint. So next thing is installing R, right? So we have to start R and we're going to start R as a super user. Right? because we want to install these genomic features and pre-process core package, not just for ourselves, but we want to install it for all of the users of our virtual box in case we make additional users. All right, so let's do that. So I'm just going to say sudo r, and then I'm just going to use the bioconductor package. So I'm just going to install the bioconductor manager, um, and it will just install in the default library. And then I'm going to install preprocess core first, um, just because why not? Um, and this will take a little while because it will have to has to download the package and install it, um, but it won't be too bad. This one is relatively quick. So it will start compiling right here. You can see that it's compiling some C code, which you can see from GCC. Um, it's GNU 99 C code. Um, it already finished. I am going to update all of the packages. It doesn't take too much additional time. And it's always good to have your software up to date, even if it's just in a virtual box. Um, so it's, it's going to take a little while. And then we are going to install genomic features that will take a little bit more time. Just getting things ready and set up, right? R is going to be important because we are going to use R to build our whole pipeline and to call different programs and these kinds of things. All right, byte compiling, preparing for lazy loading. Um, I hope the sound of my laptop speeding up is not too noticeable um, because it is getting relatively warm. Um, I am, of course, using streaming software and I'm also running a virtual box. Um, so that was one of the things that I was a little bit worried about is that is it not going to kind of collapse under the weight of all of the strain that I put on the CPU? Uh, but I think so far everything's going fine. Um, I hope that it's okay, guys, that you don't have too many frames missing or that it's too blocky. Um, and of course, the thing that it says here is not interesting at all, right? This is just compiling packages, compiling packages. Um, and as long as you have all of the requirements, right? So as long as uh, libssl is installed, xml2 and curl, um, it, it should all work and it should not encounter any errors. But of course you never know, right? There's always a little bit of debugging that you need to do when installing these things. Um, but I think this, this should, be, should be okay. But uh, if there's any like helicopter noises in the background, then that's just my laptop having a heart attack from doing a virtual box and OBS and doing the whole like YouTube thing that uh, 
because I can of course only test so much. So I'm a little bit worried that it will uh, that it will break down at a certain point and say, well, you're asking too much of me. All right, next package. All right, we, it, we just have to wait for this, right? And, uh, yeah, this is just all the way updating, updating, updating. So it's a it's it's just a lot of additional tools that it installs that we are going to need, and this is just for having better control over matrices, and it's actually using like BLAS or the basic linear algebra system, so. That's pretty good. And of course, if you start your virtual box with four cores, uh, this part will run a lot faster as well. So always make sure that you allocate as many cores as you can to your virtual box, but don't allocate all of them, right? Because your Windows, your host operating system, the thing that is running virtual box also needs to be able to survive, right? We are not we don't want to burn down the computer um, by giving it eight cores while the computer only has eight cores. All right, so all of the packages were installed successfully. Then we need one more, which is genomic features. I'm just going to paste it in, right? It's just the standard bioconductor installation of a package. Um, and it's just going to install a whole bunch of them in this case. All right, so let's switch back to the PowerPoint and start thinking about the next thing to install. So installing Trimomatic. So Trimomatic is a is a very good program. I, I like it a lot. I've used it in the past. It, it trims our reads, right? So it snips off the ends that we don't need, um, but it has a couple of additional requirements. So again, uh, we first want to install Git, which is a version control software manager, which allows us to kind of get stuff from GitHub. And besides that, we need AND. And AND is the build system for Java. Uh, one of the build systems for Java, and it's one of the older ones. Um, so once it's done installing the packages in R, um, we are going to install Git, we are going to install AND, and then of course we are going to start making our environment, which means putting everything in the place where it belongs, right? Because Trimomatic is not a package which is standardly available for Debian, um, so we need to install it somewhere. And I thought that it would be good to install everything in a folder called software. So we're just gonna put it on our, in our home folder and we are going to install this not for everyone, but just for our own user, right? So in theory, another user could install a different version of Trimomatic or could install a different software tool altogether to trim reads. Uh, but the idea is to put everything nice and clean. All right, so it's almost done, I think. Let's, uh, let's switch back. And of course, we can always install multiple things at the same time, right? We could just open up another terminal folder um, by saying, um, give me a new window. Where's that terminal? Um, new window. And we could just directly start with the other installation. So let's just do that, right? So I'm going to say um, sudo apt install git, just to do some things in parallel. Password is one, two, three, four. Very good. Yes, I want to continue and it will start installing Git um, and then we will install AND um, at the same time. So we can double up a little bit. Of course, we only have two cores, um, so it's not going to be uh, and we will install AND as well. It will take 200 MBs, which is perfectly fine because it will also start installing Java. So it will also install the OpenJDK, which we need to compile all of the Java. Alrighty then. So that's done. So um, we will say mkdir, make dir, make a software dir where we will put all of our software. Right, so we can do cd to change our directory and then we go into the software directory. So now we need to, um, now we need to get a local copy of Trimomatic, right? So, and the local copy of Trimomatic, let me switch you guys back to the PowerPoint. Uh, we can get that um, by doing a git clone of uh, the GitHub repository. It's made by userdel labs and it's called Trimomatic.git. And we can do this because we installed git. So I'm just going to copy this command and put it into the terminal. So I'm just gonna say paste 
and then it is going to say I'm cloning into Trimomatic and this is a very small tool. Um, we will go into the Trimomatic uh, folder, which is with a capital, and then we are just going to say and. And now you will see that it will fail. And this happens a lot in bioinformatics tools. And this is because we are trying to install it in Debian. And Trimomatic, the guys that made it, they only test on Ubuntu. And Ubuntu has a slightly different version of Java. So we can fix this very easily, right? It tells me actually what the error is. It says that the target option 1.5 is no longer supported. Use 1.6 or later. Um, so let's do that. I made a little slide for that. So let me show you guys the slide first. Um, so the slide is very easy. Had like We need to update the version of Java. Debian has a newer version. So we have to open up the build.xml file, which it complains about. And then we just have to go to line 34 and we have to change the source from 1.5 to 1.6 um, because that is the version that is installed under Debian. Um, so let's do that. So we are going to go and we are going to say activities, go to our files. We now see that we have a software folder and inside of the software folder, we have Trimomatic. And then here we go to the build.xml. We say right click, open up with a text editor. We go to line 34 and here we indeed see that it says source is version 1.5. I'm going to say version 1.6 and here version 1.6. I'm going to save it and then I'm just going to close it and run the build tool again. So I'm just gonna issue the end command and now it should compile it. So no problem, two seconds taken and we now have Trimomatic. All right, so it says that it's building a jar file and this is the jar file that we are going to execute. Um, so if we want to run Trimomatic to test it, um, we can just say Java minus jar and then it is built in dist slash jar slash uh, Trimomatic um, release candidate one. And then you see that it tells us that the usage is that we have to tell it to do paired end or single end, and it has a whole bunch of additional options that we can set. Good, so Trimomatic installed, um, R, the packages in R are still compiling, um, but that will finish at a certain point. Good, so we go back to our software folder and we prepare to do the next one. So the next one is, uh, okay, so this is Trimomatic, once we do and, uh, then it should say build successful, took zero seconds the last time. Good, so the next thing that we want to install is the software which is our splice transcript alignment to a reference also called star. So this is our aligner, right? So this is software which allows us to take reads, take a reference genome, take a reference transcriptome and mash those three together. Um, so let's just install it. It follows more or less the same structure. It's just using make which is the C++ build system instead of using AND. Um, there are no requirements for this software to install. We already have everything. We already had installed Git. So we can just say Git clone, um, the star aligner, and then we go into the source folder and we just type make. And then of course we want to test it in the end. So let's just do that. We can do that while it is actually installing R. Um, so I'm going to clone star. So I'm going to just paste it. And there we go, it will download the software, take a little bit of time. And then we can go into it and we can just compile it. I do hope that the R thing will finish soon. It's taking up a lot of like CPU space. I'm looking at my... <laughs> uh, oh, can you... Uh, sorry, I was... Uh, where can we find the PDFs? Yeah, I didn't put the PDFs online yet. Um, let me actually do that. That should be relatively easy for me to do um, so that you guys can do the PDF. Not only do we have the PDF, all of the code that we are using is also available on, um, on uh, GitHub so that you can just copy paste it in. Um, let me put that in the chat. Um, let me open up the chat. It's still running anyway, right? So. And so you can get all of the code that we're using for today here. Um, this gist, um, let me 
show you the gist actually. Um, let's go to Firefox. Um, so this is how it looks. So these are the scripts and other things for RNA-Sec. So we're not at this step yet. We're not building our genome. So we are currently doing the install software dos sh. So this was giving yourself pseudo writes. Um, this is then running the virtual box. And then currently we are at this step for star. So here is where you can find all of the commands that we will be issuing today. Um, so just click the link in chat and it will bring you to here. Um, and it has this section which is called install software. So we're still installing the software. Um, and the PDFs, I will definitely make sure that the PDFs are online. Um, probably um, when we are done, I will update the description. So you can find it down in the description. You can find a link to the, the PDFs once we're, once we're done. And then there's another question. Can you show again how to open the file, uh, please? Oh, okay, yeah, so the file, um, let me switch back. So the way that we open up the file is we just go to activities and we say here, files, right? Um, then let me close this one because I already had it open. So if you go to files, it starts in your home directory, right? So we have software and then we go to uh, Trimomatic, we click on the build.xml so that it's blue. We right click, we say open with text editor and then it opens it up. And then we just scroll down and we go to line 34 and we change the target from 1.6 or from 1.5 to 1.6 because we, we are just telling it that you, you need this version of Java, right? And the version of Java that it needs is at least 1.6 um, since that is the version that it's installed in Debian. Is that okay, Leo? So yeah, and the PDFs I will put online, the PDFs will be down below in the description once, we are, uh, once we're done uh, with, the, uh, with the lecture. All right, let's see if it finished. Um, so it's still doing a couple of things. So we, the star download finished and um, it is still doing the compilation for the R package. It's a big, big R package, this genomic ranges package, and it pulls in a lot of dependencies. Um, so we, it's just, we just have to wait for it. Doesn't matter because we can do two things in parallel. That's why I took two cores. Um, so we can use the other core to start compiling star. Um, so the way that we do that is we say CD um, star, right? So go into the folder and then it, it has a source folder. So we have to go into the star and then into the source folder. If you type ls, we see that there's a whole bunch of files here, um, but to compile this, we can just type make, and then it will just start compiling um, the software. There are a lot of warnings, um, which is a little bit worrisome if you're compiling code. Um, generally, if you have FC code, you, you hope that there are no warnings, um, but the software is, it's academic software, right? So the star aligner is a relatively new aligner. So there are some, uh, there are some, well, it's not bugs, right? It's just warnings, but generally you want to have no warnings when you are compiling code. Good, all right, perfect. So good that that worked. All right, so it's just compiling, compiling, compiling. On the one, it does star. On the other, it's doing the R package. Um, so it'll finish at a certain point in time. Um, fortunately, star is not that, uh, not that heavy, so to speak. But it takes a little bit of time. And again, I want to point out um, for, uh, I already put the link um, in the uh, description, I think. When I type and in the Trimomatic directory, it shows build failed. Okay, but then that's not the, the error. If you go up, um, there should be a line where it tells you what the error is, because this is just telling you that the compilation failed. But there should be a line when you, when you scroll up a little bit, um, the line should have some kind of an, an error in there. And you were the one doing it under Debian, right? Uh, no, under Ubuntu. So, um, so yeah, scroll up, find the find the error, find where it says error 
could not find something or could not do this. It now just had the, the thing that you copied into the chat is not the, the error. It's just the, the message that the compilation failed. And that's always a thing, right? So uh, that's just a warning. Warnings don't matter. So that's also not the, the error, right? It says compiling 65 source files, warning, source release, requires target release 1.6, which is which is fine because we just set the SART, uh, the, oh, did you update both of them? Or did you only update the source? Um, let me show you. So if we go here, uh, we go to files um, and we go to, okay. So you can always test it, right? So you can test it by using the um, command, which is, um, let me put the command for you in chat, um, just to make sure that it compiled successfully. Uh, where's my Firefox? There's my Firefox. So you can just, if, if it compiled successfully, you can say Java minus jar, and then it's in the dist folder. And let me actually get the command from here because I just typed it right here. So it's this command. I'm just going to copy it from here. And if you would execute that command from the home folder, so if you are in the Trimomatic folder, um, then you should be able to um, get the output that we just had. Um, let me show you that just because star compiled. So star compiled, right? It, it just ends with a warning. Um, so if we do dot slash star, then we execute star and then it says that yes, you can use star, right? It tells me that it was compiled. Um, it was compiled here um, and it gives you some information about star itself and the manual. Um, so let me actually go back to Trimomatic, cd Trimomatic, and then we can just use this command, which is uh, java minus jar. So if you execute this command, you should say, it should just show you the usage. Um, so if it tells you at this point that file not found, cannot find Trimomatic.jar, um, then the compilation did not work. Good, so the R is also done, so that is really nice. So we can actually test that. So I'm going to say library. Um, oh, no, that's not the one that I want. I'm going to say library genomic ranges, uh, genomic features, sorry. All right, so that seems to load okay. It says welcome to Bioconductor, so that should be okay. So yeah, Leo, let me know if it works. If it doesn't, um, then just send me the whole output by email and I can help you later on. That, uh... All right, so that worked. And we also want to load preprocess core just to check. And that also works. Good, so all of the R packages also installed successfully. All right, so we can close one of these. So let's go out of Trimomatic, right? So we see that we now have star installed and we have Trimomatic installed, which means that we are able now to um, take reads, cut the bad parts off or the parts with low quality, cut the adapters off, and we are also able to take reads and align them to a genome. We still don't have a genome. We still don't have a transcriptome but we're getting there, right? So it's going to be more software. All right, so the next step is going to be installing Picard Tools. So Picard Tools is a little bit different install-wise. Um, it starts again by getting it from GitHub, so we're going to get the latest version um, from the Broad Institute. Um, and so we're just going to clone it, we're going to go in there, and this time we are going to use Gradle um, so Gradle is the new build system for Java, um, and it's similar to Ant, um, but you'll see that it's slightly different than Ant because it will start downloading a whole bunch of additional things. Um, but this is what we're going to do. So let's just quickly switch back um, and let's just execute the commands. So I'm just going to get them from here. So I'm going to copy 
and I'm going to clone. So I'm going to clone in Picard. And it takes a little bit of time to download it. Although it's going relatively fast, like 100 MB per second is not bad. It's not bad. All right, so we are going to go into Picard and then we are going to say Gradle W and we want to do Gradle W, let me check. And it is called Shadow Jar. I don't know why it's called Shadow Jar, but that's the name of the package that we want to compile. Um, so we're just going to press enter and now it will start downloading the, this, the software. It will start the daemon and it will start downloading all of the dependencies from online uh, to be able to compile Picard tools. Um, so it's still configuring, but after this, it will start downloading. And you can see that it's downloading using both cores um, because it's downloading two things at the same time. So it will compile the project and um, then start compiling all of the dependencies. Um, and then afterwards it will compile this shadow jar, um, which is just the Picard software itself. So compile Java, we'll throw some warnings, which is perfectly fine. Um, seven warnings in total. I think that's the total number of warnings that we are expecting and it will execute. So now it should have compiled this. Um, so just to check, um, we are going to say, um, go into the build folder and then we're going to do an LS and then there should be in lips, I think, um, there is the Picard tool. So we have the Picard snapshot all dot jar. So this is the one. So we, we compiled two versions of Picard. Um, this is the current version from GitHub. So we are just going to test that it works. So we're going to say Java minus jar um, Picard minus and it works. So it tells us that there are a lot of things that we can do, right? So there's a lot of different sub tools in Picard. Picard is more or less this Swiss army knife um, to do everything uh, related to BOM files and some files. Um, it's very similar to some tools in a way. Um, it can do things like indexing stats. Um, hey, it can collect base calling metrics. Um, so it's a really nice kind of Swiss army knife to have um, for your pipeline. Um, it can also do things with VCF files. So it can, for example, fix VCF headers, um, and it can also add things to BOM and some files to, to fix them or to update them while you're doing it. All right, let's go all the way back to the software folder. And then let's switch again to the presentation. So after Picard, the next tool that we want to install is HTSLib. So HTSLib is a very interesting tool because it is the core tool of a lot of packages. We already installed HTSLib when we were doing the R folder. So when we were installing these R packages, they also installed HTSLib for R. Um, so it is this library which has all kinds of different tools which are used by some tools and by BCF tools. Um, so that's why I'm going to uh, do all of the three together. Um, so the, these have to be next to each other in the same directory. But first I need to have a dependency. So it uses autoconf. Autoconf is a C tool. So it allows, um, uh, it allows C code to be independent of a platform. So it will, the autoconf tools contain tools which will scan the system that it's working on and it will generate a make file for you so that you can just use make to compile it um, and all of the spe hardware specific things or, or more or less all of the OS specific things will be uh, fixed by auto tools. All right, so let's go and um, install auto tools first. That's going to be really, really quick because it's a very, very small, uh, very small package. It's only four MBs, so it's going to be installed like this. So after we've installed auto tools, we are going to clone htslib, which is the kind of core. So both some tools, BCF tools, and a lot of other software depends on htslib being available. Um, we are going to clone some tools as well. And then we are going to clone BOM tools or uh, BCF tools for 
dealing with VCF and BCF files. All right. So we are then going into HTSLib and HTSLib is a little bit strange. Um, and let me show you guys what I mean. So when you go into HTSLib, you have to have a git sub, sub module in it initialization. So git as a version control system, um, it has um, the ability to, to have sub modules. But we need to make sure that all of the submodules from the HTS library are downloaded. So that's what this command does. So it, it says git submodule update all of the submodules and do this recursively. And if they're not there, initialize them. So and let's see what that does. Um, it's, it's very, very simple. So we're just going to take this command. We're going to paste it in. And it's just going to download HTS codex, which it depends on. So, and that's it. Um, it, it. It's just a single sub package. Um, but if you forget to do this, then the compilation uh, will fail. So the next step is to use auto tools um, to reconfigure the system, right? So it, 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 HTSLib can be compiled under Windows, under Mac, under Linux, um, but it needs to know which operating system it's running on, and it's using uh, it's using this autoconf uh, to reconfigure the build system. So we're just going to say reconfigure minus i, um, and that's also in the slides. It's also in the command. So it's just re uh, auto reconf minus i, um, and then it will generate. So it will look at which system am I on? Am I on Linux? Am I on Mac? Or am I under Windows? Um, and then it will generate a configuration file. And then we can execute this configuration file to set up all of the parameters that we need. So here it will tell me, and here it will look at all kinds of things, if they are available or not. And so it looks for the compiler and is the compiler working? Uh, it tests the compiler. So it does all of these steps uh, to make sure that it can compile HTSLib with as many optimizations as possible, right? So some things are not available, so it will not use that. Um, some things are available, so it will start using that. Um, so after this is done, we can now just type make, and then it will start compiling htslib, or it will compile the C++ code. Um, so, all right, let's go back quickly. So htslib, auto reconf, uh, configure, make. This will be very similar for some tools. Right, so after we've compiled htslib, we're going to compile some tools, our Swiss army knife for everything sum and bum related. Um, and here we are going to do an auto header. So this will generate headers. Um, then we do an auto conf again. So um, we are going to tell it that we don't want any syntax warnings. And then we're going to configure and we're going to make it um, very similar to the one uh, to, to auto conf. Uh, so very similar to htslib. So you can see, um, oh, yeah, no, you can't see. So you can see that it's currently compiling CRUM support so that we can use not only BAM files or SUM files, but also CRUM files, which are the new type of CRUM and BAM file. All right, very good. So htslib compiled. Um, it doesn't tell you that it compiled successfully, but if you do, oh, let me go into here. If you do ls, um, then you can see that it does that it did compile um, something. And what it compiled, which we are going to need later on, is bgzip. So this is a blocked gzip, um, but it compiled some other programs as well. Um, so the HTS file is also compiled. So these in green, um, these are executable files. Um, it also compiled our libhts.so, and this is our dynamic library that um, some tools and bump tool need. All right, so let's go back and we are going to go into the some tools folder. We are going to say auto header. Um, then we are going to say auto conf minus v no syntax, right? Don't show us all of the syntax warnings. Oh, this needs to be a minus. Um, so this will tell the configuration script that we're not really interested in all of the configuration or all of the syntax errors that are there. Um, it, it's not syntax errors, it's um, syntax warnings. Then we're going to do configure to configure it. 
So it knows which compiler we're using, which system we're on. And then we're just going to type make, and then it will start making some tools um, from scratch. And you can see here that it does this inclusion of htslib. So it is using the latest version of htslib to compile our code. Um, and these two need to match, right? So the, the htslib version needs to match the some tools version. And this is very important because if it mismatches, um, then there's going to be issues. All right, some tools done. Um, so I made a similar slide from some tools for BCF tools, but BCF tools requires the exact same commands um, because it's made by the same guys, right? So it's it's not that it's uh, that different. All right, so we go to BCF tools. Um, we do an LS to see what's there. And then we just say auto header. So I can just press the up key to get back the previous commands that I did. So I'm just going to use press up, 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 make sure that I get the exact same commands that I did last time since they worked. Um, so make the headers, make the configuration, do the configuration, and then make uh, build, build the software. Right. And then after we're done, we're going to test them, right? Just to make sure that both some tools and BCF tools uh, work. Leo says make. Make, that's the uh, build system for C. So you nowadays have C make as well, which is kind of a combination of auto tools and make. Um, but make is the standard way of, of building, um, building code under Linux and under Windows. So make files are, are very, very generic. Again, you see that it includes htslib. So these, these versions need to match together um, to make sure that everything works. All right, so let's test BCF tools. So when I do BCF tools, I do dot slash BCF tools to execute it. Um, and you can see that it uh, that it works. Ah, it's all meant to type it in my terminal. No worries, no worries. Um, you can be as loud in chat as you want. Actually, it helps being loud in chat um, because YouTube thinks that, oh, this is a nice stream. There's a lot of people chatting. So it will suggest the stream to more people. All right, so we have BCF tools. Let's test our some tools as well. So I'm just going to do dot slash some tools. The nice thing is in, in Linux, you can actually um, press top. So you can press SA, then press top, and it will um, autocomplete the command for you. Um, and that also works, right? So you can see that it, it actually is version blah, blah, blah. Um, it's using this HTS lib, um, and it's a tool for alignment in the sum format. Um, it also does BOM formats as well. Good, so that's another set of tools that we need in our pipeline. We need some tools, we need BOM tools, uh, BOM tools, we need BCF tools. Uh, we also need some of the tools from htslib, like the blocked gzip. Um, so that's kind of what it is. So let's go out of the some tools folder and then move on to the next installation that we need. So the next installation that we're going to need, and I have to switch to PowerPoint, um, is GATK. So the GATK is a massive, massive software tool. Um, it contains a lot of different tools related to sequencing and these kinds of things. We are going to use it for the recalibration around indels, and we are going to use it for um, the, the fact that it can do a lot of things with some and bump files. It contains a lot of QC tools as well. So we need to download it. And normally I would always like to download it and compile it myself. The problem with GATK is, is that downloading it, because it is such a massive tool, it is around two gigabytes in size when you take the whole Git repository. So I decided to just get the pre-compiled binary. So that means that we're just going to get the software and then we're just going to unzip it and that's going to be it. We can compile it from source. You have all of the requirements already installed. Um, it compiles the same as um, PCAR tools. So you could just do a git clone of the GATK repository and then use Gradle to build it. Um, but since it takes so much time to download the whole repository um, and it takes a lot of time to compile all of the code, I thought it would be quicker 
to just download it and directly execute it, uh, unzip it, right? So that it's directly done. All right, so let's do that. So let's go back to the terminal. And, um, oh, I did put this code in here. That's weird. All right, so um, how am I going to do that? So I, I just noticed that my script that I was using, right, the one that I put online here, has no GATK code. So I forgot to, uh, to put that in. Um, so that's a little bit annoying, but we can do it slightly differently. So I'm just going to get the link from online. GATK download. So just that I don't have to type it in because I don't like typing in long paths. Um, download the latest version. Um, I can actually show you guys what I'm doing as well. So I'm just going to go here and then here it says download the latest, latest release. So that's what I did, right? I just searched for GATK download, click here, um, click on the download. And then here you have the zip file. So I'm just going to do right click, copy link, and then we're going to go back to our Debian and we're just going to do a wget of this address, right? So it will start downloading it. Um, and downloading it in this case, because you don't get all of the history, um, it's still a large software package, right? But you don't get like the five gigs of history that, that is um, inside of the project. Um, can you paste the link in the chat, please? Yes, of course, of course. So the GATK link is here. No worries, no worries. So you're actually quite on, on track then, Leo, to uh, get everything installed, if you're at the same step. That, uh... Can we use Conda Mamba to install packages? You could, if you want, but then you're not really doing it from scratch. Then you're just using Conda. So we are downloading more or less the latest version from GitHub, from everything. Um, and that is why um, we are just doing it step by step, more or less from scratch. All right, so we got our zip file ready um, and we are just going to unzip it. So I'm going to say unzip um, GA, press stop. It will auto complete for me and I'm going to press enter and it will do the GATK. So to test this, we can do again do Java minus jar. We are going to say GATK and then it is GATK. And if you press stop a couple of times, it actually gives you the um, suggestions. Um, so you can see that there are um, a lot of different. So in this case, we are going to use the local version of GATK. If you're on a cluster or on a multi-core machine, not a multi-core machine, but if you're on a, on a multi-node cluster, you can use the Spark version. Um, so this allows you to distribute jobs across a cluster of, of computers. Um, but we're going to do the GATK minus package, and then we are going to test the local version. We just press enter, and then we see that we see something very similar to what we saw when we did Picard tools. Um, so it shows you that all of these different tools are available. So there's a tool which is methylation type caller, um, gather tranches, reblock GVCF. Um, there's even some of the Picard tools in here. I don't know if GATK contains all of the Picard tools, but a lot of the Picard tools are also available via GS GATK. All right, so that's the GATK installed. Very good. Almost there, right? So we almost have everything ready because we're almost, if you think back to the list that we had of all of the software, then the GATK was one of the last tools on the list. Um, so I think that the next code is also not going to be there. But the final thing that we need is the sequence read archive toolkit. So the SRA toolkit is this toolkit which allows us to automatically download sequences from the sequence read archive. So if you think about sequencing, right? If you have a sequencing run, um, then you get two, or if you have a, a paired end run, you get two files. You get a right side read and a left side read. And these files are humongous. They are literally gigabytes big. 
Um, so you can download them using your, your Firefox or Chrome or these kinds of things, but that's very slow. And the GATK made this uh, SRA toolkit to allow you to very quickly download these large files. So it allows this download of these files in parallel. The big issue is, is that the SRA toolkit, again, is very, very big, and it is not available for Debian. Fortunately, it is available, available for CentOS. So I'm just going to install the CentOS version in Debian, and this will work um, because Linux 1 and Linux 2 are just little different flavors from each other. Um, so let me get the, uh, the address. I have to switch back to here then. I'm just going to very quickly get it out of the PowerPoint and then also throw it in chat um, so that the people um, using it um, or following it can directly get it as well because it's this massive link again. Um, so GATK, SRA Toolkit. So the link for the SRA Toolkit is here and I'm going to first do it in chat. So this is the one that you need um, for Ubuntu. If you are doing this under Ubuntu, there is an Ubuntu version available as well. So let me actually look at that. Um, so let me go to the Ubuntu version. Where's my Firefox there? Oh. Um, so if we go to um, SRA Toolkit, um, we go here. And then uh, we have the SDK, faster dump, um, errors during download. Let me see. Ah, where is it? SRA toolkit here. And then it recently changed. So you can go to the downloads page. Um, so for Ubuntu, there is a non sudo tar archive. The same for CentOS, by the way. Um, but we are going to uh, use the uh, apt-get install script. Um, we're not going to use the script, but we are going to install it ourselves. Um, so make sure that if you are doing this on Ubuntu, that you take the Ubuntu version. Um, if you are doing this under Debian, the operating system that we are using, we are going to use the CentOS version, just to, to make sure. All right, so I have the link, I think, still under my clicker. So I'm just going to say wget and paste. So just get this SRA toolkit um, file. Then the next step is to unzip it. So um, we are first going to make a directory because this is a tar file. And this is normally used to extract over your whole Linux system, which I don't like. I like things to be locally installed and not globally installed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a directory. Oh, um, I'm typing somewhere else. Where am I typing? Ah, okay. Let me actually bring that one back. So I am going to click here to make sure that I have my mouse here. So I'm going to make a directory called SRA Toolkit. Oh, SRA Toolkit, right? So I'm going to extract everything in this file, in this tar.gz file into the SRA Toolkit. So how am I going to do this? And this is a little, like we call it a donkey bridge. Um, it's a mnemonic in English. Um, so you're going to say tar, then you do minus, and then you say extract the file, right? So XZF, extract the file. So there's this famous um, type in a tar command, which is valid, right? Um, like they're defusing one of these nuclear bombs and it's this, this cartoon. So they're defusing this nuclear bomb and then it says like type in a valid tar command. And the only thing that you have to remember is tar minus extract. So X, Z, Z file, extract the file. So we are going to extract the file called SRA toolkit dot 3.0. So this whole big file name, and then we are going to say minus C. So where do we want to extract it to? Well, we want to extract it to the SRA toolkit folder that we just made. 
and then we're just going to press enter and then it will extract everything from this tar archive into the sra toolkit good so then and this is this is really interesting i like this a lot so to use the sra toolkit um, you have to use this um, kind of archaic configuration tool so it's called the vdb config interactive tool but you have to run it and you can do a little bit of setup like where do i want my stuff stored um, so i wanted to show you guys that as well because the sra toolkit is a very important tool to use um, so i i need to have this command so i'm just going to have you guys go back i'm going to close it and i'm just going to copy paste it in um, i'm going to copy paste it into the chat as well for you guys um, so that everyone following a wrong has this sra toolkit so what we're going to do is we're going to go dot slash which means execute from the sra toolkit folder user local ncbi and bin vbd config so we are going to execute this vbd config so let me paste it in here as well oh um something went wrong there because it's sra toolkit vbd config minus interactive and then that's it I don't know why there was something in the back and in the front. Oh, I'm deleting stuff again from the PowerPoint. It's so bad. So bad. All right, so let's run this interactive configuration. Um, ah, this is the problem. It needs to be a little bit different minus. So let me. Uh, let me see. Unknown argument minus n. How do you mean minus n? Minus interactive. All right, I'm just going to go into the folder. So I'm going to go into SRA toolkit. I'm going to go into user, local SRA, uh, local NCBI SRA toolkit bin. And then I'm just going to say V db minus config the tar line gave me this warning you must specify one of the so did ah right yeah it's probably the uh it's probably the minus sign so it is a uh, tar minus oh tar minus I downloaded the zip file for Ubuntu from the website. All right. You must specify. Yeah, but you, you specified minus X extract the file, right? And then the name of the tar. So like this. Because it says that you did not spy, uh, so specify an A, C, D, T, U, R, U, X, but you should have specified an X into the command. So it's tar minus extracts a file, then a space, and then the name of the big tar file. So I think that that's the, uh, that's the issue there. Let me actually fix my own error, um, interactive. Why does that not work then? Let me see, because VBD config just executed. Oh, that is interesting. It's just an uh, VBD validate, VBD. Where's the VBD config then? Ha, huh, interesting. Um, because in the end, I only want one tool, faster Q dump. So please run PBD config. Ah, it's minus minus interactive. Ah, that's the issue. That is the issue. Um, yeah, so I'm just forgetting a, a minus. Let me update that as well in the, uh, in the Excel sheet. Or uh, Excel, in the PowerPoint, right? So it's VBD config minus minus interactive. So if we execute it, then we get to see this screen. 
So this screen looks very archaic and it is very archaic. This is kind of how we set up tools in, well, 2001 or something. So the only thing that we have to specify here is the cache folder. So we can press top, 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 top. And you see this little red thingy just jumping from one to another, right? So I'm going to say stop when it's in front of cache. I'm going to press enter. I'm going to press stop again. And I'm going to choose a location of our user repository. So I'm going to press enter. And then where do I want my file stored? And this is where I'm going to top again. So I'm going to top all the way to create directory. And then I'm going to say um, cache and uh, cache underscore ncbi. And I'm going to make a new folder. Then I'm going to go to that folder and I'm just going to press enter. And then I'm going to say top. Okay. Do you want to change the location to home, Denny, cache, and CBI? And I'm going to say yes. Right? So I'm setting up the SRA toolkit. The way that I'm doing that is just by specifying the cache directory because it needs to know where to store temporary files. All right. So now it's, it's all set. So we can now just do top, 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 top again. So we go top, 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 all the way until we hit exit. We press enter. It asks us, do we want to save the changes? Yes, we want to save the changes. Everything was saved successfully. And now we should be able to execute the tool that we want. Because the tool that we want is this faster Q dump, right? This allows us to dump fast Q files from the sequence read archive directly to our hard drive. So dot slash faster Q dump. And now it works. Everything is set up perfectly fine. This is what we want, right? So in the end, we just want to execute the program and it has to tell us that it's a faster Q dump, a path, options, these kinds of things. Good. So a little bit of confusion. What is the command line you use to open this thing? Yeah. So let me do that once more. So we go and we type. So we go all the way in, right? So we say in software, go into the SRA toolkit, go into user, go into local, go into NCBI, go into SRA tools, go into the bin folder. Then there we have dot slash to execute. And the program that we want to execute is VDB minus config. And then we say minus minus interactive. So let me just throw that in the chat for you. Uh, no, not copy as HTML, just copy. And I'm going to throw that in the cache. Uh, sorry, there has to be a dot in front. So dot slash VBD content interactive, right? So this allows you to um, interactively execute this thing. So let me execute it for you again. So it's very archaic. I agree. It's something that looks like 1990s, right? And it's just for setting up your cache folder. I don't have a user directory in SRE tools. Okay, so you could try to, because depending on how you extracted the file, it might extract over, um, over the other stuff. I would try getting the, um, ah, it's not a U, yeah, no, it's a USR. So for user, um, so you could just press stop, right? So let me actually go out, top exit, right? So this is the path, the way that it looks for me. Software is the one that we made. Then we have SRA toolkit, USR, local, NCBI, SRA tools, and then bin. So yeah, that might be the issue that it's, uh, yeah, it's just USR. So if you go in, um, like I said, if you go to CD software, CD SRA toolkit, and then if you press top right, it shows you what there is. So there should be an at the ETC folder and a USR folder. So USR, then you can just continue pressing top because there's only one folder in there at each time. Um, and then bin. Okay, so you didn't extract it properly. 
yeah, just Google for, um, because it might be a little bit different between Ubuntu and Debian. Um, and then um, you can, you could actually like rewind this, the stream to that point. Um, do you mind if I continue with um, the others? Because we still have like, we've always been, almost been streaming for two hours and I was planning on only doing two hours, but we're almost there fortunately. Um, so the SRA toolkit actually, we're only going to use it today um, to set it up. I will actually update the, uh, um, yep, that is fine. Um, don't worry, go ahead. All right, tough, that uh, is cool. Uh, and Daily Barry, I actually um, allowed you to uh, do the, uh, because it, it, for some reason, YouTube blocked your comment. <laughs> Just because it's a tar command, like valid tar commands are, are difficult. All right, so after we've set up the SRA toolkit, right? We now have everything. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. Um, so we have everything. So we can do, we have all of the tools that we need for our pipeline. But now I want to make sure that I don't have to type all of these paths all of the time, right? So I'm going to make a little bin folder. And then inside of this bin folder, I'm going to sim link all of our tools. So that for example, when we update star, because if a new update comes out, we can just do a git pull. It will pull down the newest version. We type make, and it will update the latest star. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go um, back, right? So I'm going to um, show you guys my screen again. So I'm going to go cd dot dot. I'm going to make a deer, which is called bin. And here, all of the binary files are going to be linked in. And then I'm going to go into the bin folder and I'm going to make symbolic links, meaning that I am going to make a star executable here, which is not a real file, but it is a file which points to this star path, right? So to this path of star, which is home, Denny, software, star, source, star, right? Because that's where the executable is. For bgzip, the executable is here, home, Denny, software, HTS, lib, bgzip. But by making symbolic links, I can actually update the code in the future, right? I can just put a new version there and the symbolic link will then point to the newest version instead of to the old version. All right, so let's do this. Um, and um, I think again, I did not put this part on the, uh, on the on the online repository so let me actually copy it from here and then put it for the online uh, put it inside the online repository for you guys um, because i'm really sorry about that i have to update that to make sure right all right so let me get that let me put it in here Let's get the ln minus s's, all of them. Oh yeah, so you guys can't see what I'm doing, but I'm just I'm just making sure that I update the uh, the home uh, or the home folder. Like I've been streaming for two hours almost. So, um, so like um, I can actually show you guys. So Notepad plus plus, right? So I just I just put all of the commands in here, um, and I'm just going to update the um, script online um, so that the online script also contains it um, so that you can just get it from there. Um, so this is in install software. I'm going to just say edit this. And the edit button is all the way at the top. So I'm going to do install software all the way to the down. And I'm also going to update the other commands in there. So I'm going to just say hashtag uh, make symbolic links, right? And I can show you guys that as well. That I'm doing that, so I'm just adding um, this. So I'm going to say, make their bin, cd bin, and then and this is the command to do it. And then it, for some reason, stopped at BCF tools. So after BCF tools, we had the GATK put that in as well. I'm going to say baget GATK. And then it was just unzip the GATK. So let me put that in as 
well. And then we had the SRA, short read archive, and that's a couple more commands. But short read archive is this, they get make the directory for it just so that you guys can follow along um, and then tar extracts a file that seems to be okay and then the last one is interactive so and this you can execute directly from here but it's actually not it's minus minus interactive all right, so now we have everything again. So make the symbolic links, and then I'm just going to say um, update, and then you guys should have it as well. So if you go now to the gist link, um, then you should be able to now see the SRA commands and the symbolic links as well. Good, all right, so let's make all of these symbolic links so that we are sure that we can execute all of our programs. So I'm just going to paste them all in one go, right? So it's linking. And now if I look at the bin folder, then now I have BCF tools, BGZIP, FasterQDIM, SAMTools, and STAR all in this bin folder. So now I have to do the next step. So the next step is updating um, the uh, bash RC file. Right, so the bash RC file in Linux determines when I open up a terminal, what things are available on my path. Um, so let me show you guys the PowerPoint. Right, so the bash RC file is this file that when you log into a system or when you open up a terminal, it looks at this file and then sees I need to do all of these things before the user gets control. And in this case, we want to add this home bin folder to the path to make sure that every time that I open up a terminal, that I can just type star and that it will execute the star uh, command for me, right? Um, I'm actually wondering if it did the other ones. Let me actually do it. Yeah, so it also linked the other ones. So, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to open our bash RC file. We're going to put this line in here all the way on the end, and then we're just going to save our file. Um, so again, I remember that these are not here, so I'm going to edit those in, make sure that you guys can do that as well. So let's go back to here, um, and then I can go and see and update the path. So I'm going to show you guys what I'm doing in Firefox. I'm just going to add this, right? So the install software after linking this, we are going to update the bash RC file. And that's just nano. And then this is what you have to put at the end. So I'm going to say hashtag add at the end this. All right, and I'm going to press update so that you guys have an updated version. All right, so let's do this in our command. So let's close this one, go here, go to our home folder. Then I'm going to update my bash RC file. I'm going to go all the way down to the end. It's a big bash RC file. I'm going to press enter a couple of times and I'm going to add this to my path. So the only thing that it's going to do is say that every time that, um, you start your terminal, add the home bin folder to the path variable, and the path variable determines where you look for executables. I'm going to press Ctrl O to write it out, and I'm going to press Ctrl X to exit. All right, so now I'm going to close my terminal, I'm going to close this one, and I'm going to open up a new terminal. So now when I type star, it will execute the star aligner. When I type, type some tools, it will execute some tools. When I type BCF tools, it will execute BCF tools. When I type BGZIP, it will execute BGZIP. So now we have our system set up. We have all of the tools that we need and we are ready to start with RNA sequencing.
Very good. So this was where I wanted to be, at least at the end. Um, there are still a couple of slides because there are still a couple more things that we can do um, in this case. Um, but let me show you. All right, so the next thing is a new terminal, right? So we can execute some tools, bgzip, star, bcf tools, and faster dump with by just typing the commands. Uh, we also have installed Trimomatic for read and adapter trimming. We have the GATK, we have the PCAR tools for various BAMSAM tools. So we have all of the building blocks ready to start building our own RNA sequencing pipeline. And we did this all from scratch, right? Took us two hours, but we now have everything ready. So we need to have a reference genome, right? And I thought about this a lot and first I thought, should we do this for mouse? But the mouse reference is pretty big. And since I'm using a virtual machine, I only have two CPU cores available. So doing all of this for mouse would take hours and hours and hours because we need to get a reference genome, then we have to index it. So it has to make like these indexes so that it can very quickly go to first specific parts of the mouse genome. But that's of course not gonna work. So I decided to do something with yeast. Say, uh, uh, I'm not gonna say the, the name, it's, I can't pronounce it. But if, and let me actually show you that. Um, so if we go to Ensemble, right, to uh, get a, um, to get a genome. So if we go to Ensemble, the way that I always get there is just type Ensemble FTP, right? You take the first one, and then in the Ensemble FTP, if you scroll down a little bit, you see that it has all of the um, animals available here, right? So we have human, mouse, zebrafish, um, and all of the... And normally when you click on this, you go, for example, you look at the human FASTA files, right? Then you see that there's FASTA files for each of the chromosomes. So this is just the sequence chromosome by chromosome by chromosome. In the end, we now see that there's a non-chromosomal as well, which is reads or parts of the genome that haven't been assigned a chromosome. But the thing that people always wonder about is these two, right? So we have the human chromosome, primary assembly, and we have the top level. And I always get questions from people when I do alignment, should I use the top level or should I use the primary assembly? So the answer to that is that use the primary assembly because the primary assembly only contains the real chromosomes. Chromosome 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, X, Y, Z, uh, and the mitochondria, right? But it doesn't contain all of the scaffolds and all of the other more or less junk that we haven't been assigned the human genome yet, right? So that's that's one of these things. In the case that you have different flavors of your reference genome, always take the primary assembly, never take the top level. Then if we go back very quickly, we see also that we have DNA, right? Or we have DNA underscore RM. If we scroll down a little bit, we have also DNA SM. So what does this mean? Why do we have three different versions of the top level, for example, right? And why do we have RM or, or SM? So this has to do with the repeat masking, right? So in a genome, there's a lot of repeats. So we have DNA, which is the raw DNA sequence with all of the repeats still in there. We have SM, which is the soft marked, and then we have the HM version or the RM version, which is the repeat mask hard. So in this case, since we are going to align against the genome, we always want to use the primary assembly and then the DNA version that is available. So just as an intermezzo about which version should you use when you do RNA or DNA sequencing alignment. So we also need the transcriptome. And why do we need the transcriptome? Well, we need that for the intron exon boundaries, right? Because if we are sequencing mature RNA, then the introns are spliced out. 
So our sequencer needs to be told that if I find a read which overlaps exon 1 and exon 2, it needs to know that exon 1 and exon 2, although physically very far apart on the genome, are actually physically very close in the messenger RNA, the mature messenger RNA. So that is why we also need the transcriptome for alignment. Okay, so this is more or less where I wanted to stop today because we are going to set up our own genome for Sarcomyces cerevisiae. It is a 12 megabase genome, so it's really, really short, but it is a eukaryotic cell, which still means that it has introns and exons. It has 16 chromosomes and it is the first eukaryote which was sequenced and the reference strain, and this is very important, is S288C. So this is the reference strain that we have. Um, and if we are going to line RNA sequencing reads, we should align sequencing reads of the same strain to this reference. Because if we take other strains which have mutations or insertions or big deletions, uh, we might run into issues when we do RNA sac alignment. But this is the one that we're going to use. So we are going to set up our genome. And to set up our genome, the big issue is, is that when we look at the ensemble database, Sarcomyces cerevisiae only has the top level available. So it only has the full genome sequence with all of the junk in there. It does not have a... Uh, a primary assembly. So that means that not only are all of the chromosomes in, but all of the other scaffolds and patches and patch versions are also in. So we need to create our own primary assembly using R. And that is where I'm going to stop today because I've been streaming for two hours and five minutes, which is long enough on a Sunday. Still want to do some other stuff with my Sunday. And Next time, we are going to start here. You already have the code, right? If you look at the, the, the code online, then you can see that I already had some more code there. Um, but we are going to write our own little R script next time, and we're going to start there to make our own primary assembly. And then we're going to do our own transcriptome, or we're going to download the transcriptome, make it fit to our own primary assembly. Um, and um, then we are going to start aligning reads. All right, Leo, thank you for following. Thank you for the questions as well. Like it's always nice when people are actively um, following in chat. Good, so I'm just gonna scroll very quickly to the end. So we're all set, right? So we have, um, we're, we, we have all of the tools. Next time we'll go to the, diff, the first step. So we're going to do our first RNA alignment. We are going to extract our PKM values. We are going to test differential expressions. Um, and we are going to build a flexible pipeline with our scripts. And we're going to add a little bit of automated QC. How do we get the updates for the next time? Um, how do you mean the updates? You, you mean when I'm going to stream? Um, just subscribe to my channel and um, Oh, I just, I updated the GitHub layout, so it should be there now. So if you just press F5, let me get the uh, um, GitHub, let me get the code. Um, I should, I think I updated it live, um, so it should be there. Um, so so um, yeah, it, it, just subscribe to my channel and um, they will appear. Um, I will probably plan some, um, some date, uh, probably in two weeks, probably Sunday, not next week, but the week after. Um, next weekend, I'm a little bit fine, a uh, bit, little bit busy. Um, so I will have to uh, do some other stuff. Um, but I think Leo, all of the code that I added should be on, on the bottom. So just for anyone watching, I'm going to just put the link in chat again um, so that you guys um, have it. Um, it's also down in the description. So all of the code is there. So like I said, next time, what are we going to do? Your first alignment, we're going to do RPKM values, a little bit of differential expression testing, and then we're going to start building up this flexible pipeline where we can swap out different tools 
So if we want to do alignment of DNA, we might want to use BWA. If we want to do RNA alignment, we might want to use STAR, or you might want to use a completely different alignment or uh, aligner altogether. All right, and then we're going to do the um, um, automated QC. So because, of course, we have no real tools yet to look at the quality of the read. All right, been updated, couldn't just get past the extraction of the GCS file. Yeah, 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 no, it should, should, should be fine. All right, so that's it. Um, thank you guys so much for watching today. Um, in number two, I told you guys what we will do and uh, I wish you guys a very, very happy Sunday. And thank you so much for being here and um, like, subscribe and, and favorite, of course. Um, it really helps out with um, discoverability. And if you think that other people might be interested, feel free to promote and uh, um, tell people about it because that, that really helps. It's really difficult for these kinds of things to kind of automatically be advised on YouTube because YouTube is very bad at figuring out who's a bioinformatician <laughs> for some reason. So, all right, thank you so much. Enjoy your, um, the rest of your Sunday and um, I will see you guys uh, probably in two weeks um, for the second part. And then we will start really doing some RNA sec alignment. So thank you for being here and see you next time.